probably carrying on for at least another three weeks. Um, I plan on stopping this morning at Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and verse 21 solely because when you get to verse 22 of the book of Ephesians in chapter 5, Paul begins to give instructions for marriage. And I do not have the time this morning after the first 21 verses to say what I want to say about what Paul has to say about our instructions for marriage. Um, I, I certainly would encourage anyone uh, that is married or that plans on getting married, excluding my daughters, uh, to come and listen to this message. Uh, that'll catch up with you later, kids, I promise. But... Uh, um, really just already this week, the Lord put on my heart what to say, uh, beginning at verse 22 of chapter five of Ephesians next week. Uh, but this week we're going to be going through the ver first 21 verses. And so that'll push out, uh, the book of Ephesians, at least for another two weeks after this, of course, as we get to chapter six, we talk about the armor of God and, and, and certainly look forward to uh, breaking that down and, and, and really just sharing with you and preaching to you uh, the armor of God and how important it is in our lives as Christians to walk fully armed with the armor of God. But we do need to get through chapter five and, and uh, really what chapter five is, is it's a continuation of of chapter 4, as, as you know, uh, the epistles were not written, quite frankly, none of the Bible was written with chapters and with verses. It wasn't really until uh, uh, the first century that verses and, and chapters began to be uh, uh, added into the scriptures for ease of reading to the reader, because quite frankly, all of it was on scrolls, and I don't know about you, but flipping pages is already hard enough let alone wanting to read scrolls that are literally never ending, right? Without a chapter, without a verse, at least we can say in the morning, hey, I read a chapter, right? Back then, you didn't have an option. You read maybe the book of Isaiah, or you read maybe the book of Exodus, but you didn't read any chapters. And so um, I'm sort of thankful, obviously, for those uh, men that put together maybe the verses and the chapters and broke the Bible up for ease of reading uh, to those of us that we get to enjoy today. But again, chapter five is really just a continuation, if you will, of the fourth chapter. And what I want to do is I read the first seven verses of chapter number five is what I'm going to start back at Ephesians chapter four and verse 32. A couple of weeks ago, actually three weeks ago now, we ended chapter four and, uh, uh, you know, obviously uh, Sunday, the, the Sunday after that, we were in Arizona. The Sunday after that was Resurrection Sunday. So let me just remind you of the very last verse of Ephesians chapter 4 because it will tie in wonderfully into the first verse of chapter 5 and as we continue through the 21 verses that we're going to be going over this morning. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. He says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, be ye therefore followers of God, chapter 5 and verse 1, as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and have given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints." Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. He says in verse number seven, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Church family, pray with me, and then we're going to start unpacking this fifth chapter. Heavenly Father, 
Lord God, once again, thank you so much for this Get to Church Sunday. Thank you, Father, for this church family that is before me, Lord, for those that are tuning in online, Lord. Thank you for those that are going to be watching this later, Father God. I pray that the words that would proceed out of my mouth, Lord, would be words of encouragement, Lord, words of edification, Father God, that they would be used to teach, Lord God, that they would be used to preach, that they would be used to lift up the mighty name of Jesus above every name, Father God, as we just sung, what a beautiful name it is, what a wonderful name it is, what a powerful name, the name of Jesus is, Lord God. And Father, I pray this morning that you would go before me, Father God, guiding my thoughts, my words, my path this morning, Lord God, as I begin to preach from this fifth chapter of the book of Ephesians. Father, set me aside. Lord, give me what it is that you would have me say, Lord, either an illustration, uh, Lord God, or just in unpacking the scriptures, Father God, and sharing the message that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, Father God. I I ask, Lord, that our hearts, that our minds would be prepared to receive this, and that, Lord God, above all, you would be glorified in it. I ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, in verse uh, 32 of chapter 4, Paul says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. And then he goes on to say in chapter 5, verse 1, because of this, or be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. In other words, if, if, if I can piggyback, if you will, on what verse 32 of chapter 4 said, he says, be kind towards one another, be tender-hearted towards one another, forgive one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And he says in verse 5, uh, verse 1, because of this, be followers of God. Because I'm asking you to be tender-hearted, because I'm asking you to be kind, because I'm asking you, Paul says, to forgive one another as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He says, because of this, be a follower of God. I will share with you this morning this truth that many people refuse to understand or to adopt into their life as Christians. You cannot follow God and honor God if you are not kind to one another, if you are not tender-hearted towards one another, if you do not forgive one another, it is impossible to follow and to glorify and to honor God the way that we are called to in the scriptures if you do not heed, in my opinion, to the commandments of treating others the way that you want to be treated. It goes back to what Christ said in the Gospels, what many refer to as the golden rule, do unto others as they would have do unto you, as you would have them do unto you. We cannot honor God, we cannot follow God, and Paul says as dear children, if we are not willing to be kind to one another, if we are not willing to have a tender heart, a compassionate heart towards one another, if we are not willing to let go of grudges and let go of past mistakes and forgive, we cannot follow God. We will, as Paul said earlier in chapter 4, we will grieve the Holy Spirit if we have bitterness anger, wrath, unforgiveness in our hearts towards one another. It will grieve the Holy Spirit's work in our hearts and we will not be able to perform what it is the Lord would have us perform in our lives for his glory and for his honor. We must always be aware of that in our lives. We have a willing heart, sure, but are we unwilling to let go of maybe some forgiveness? Are we unwilling to be kind? Are we unwilling to be tender-hearted? If we have a willing heart for God to work in our lives, it must absolutely come with a willingness to let go, to be kind, to be compassionate, to be caring, and to forgive. He says in verse 2, and walk in love. So not only does he say 
be ye therefore followers of God, coming off verse 32 of chapter 4, but he says, and walk in love. On top of being kind, on top of being tender-hearted, on top of forgiving one another, on top of being a follower of God, he says in verse 2, and walk in love. Well, what does it mean to walk in love? Does it mean that I only have to love when I'm on my two feet and moving? No, of course not. It means we ought to live our lives in love. We ought to show forth through our walk love. And our walk can bring about a multitude of things throughout our day. It brings about interactions with others. It brings about moments of opportunity to really show the love of Christ in our lives to others. To walk in love really means to just show the love of God to those that he would have brought into our life. If we are not walking in love, and I'm going to tie this all together, if we are not walking in love, if we are not being kind, if we are not being tenderhearted, if we are not forgiving, again, it is impossible to follow God at the same time. We just can't do it. Why? Because it goes against the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives, which is to live forth the love that God the Father has shown us through Jesus Christ and the accomplished work of the cross and the empty tomb. If I'm not loving like Christ loved, then I ask, what is the purpose? He even gives an example of what walking in love might look like. He says, as Christ also hath loved us. And I can just stop right there and unpack that all morning long. How has Christ loved us? Christ came to this earth fully God, yet fully man, having to submit himself in the flesh to God the Father for the sole purpose of dying for our sins, for the sole purpose of giving up his life that you and I might have eternal life. That's what Christ did in loving us. He says, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Now, re be reminded that Paul was largely talking to a lot of Jews as well. And this was an Old Testament thing. If you would go through the book of Leviticus, you would see that when they made an offering in the tabernacle unto God, it was to be offered as a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You read through the book of Leviticus, it says it multiple times. Christ, being the final sacrifice, offered himself to God the Father for a sweet-smelling savor. In other words, it wasn't that the death of Christ physically smelt good to God, right? But that it pleased God. It was favorable to God for Christ to go and offer himself on the cross for you and I as that living sacrifice. Similar again, and this is why Paul reminds the church in Ephesus as to what they did in the Old Testament, bringing forth the goat, bringing forth the, the, the sheep, bringing forth the oxen, to offer it unto God as a sweet-smelling savor. But then in verse 3, things seem to take a turn, right? We get this encouragement in the first few verses to walk in love, to be followers of God, again, to be tender-hearted and forgiving and, and kind, even as Christ uh, has been towards us. But then Paul says in verse number three, he says, but fornication and uncleanness or covetousness, he says, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. You know, Paul begins to unpack these sins, if you will, that most certainly 
plagued many believers at the church of Ephesus during Paul's day, and quite frankly, plagued many sinners in today's church prior to them coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I would even submit this morning that still plagues many believers today that are struggling to overcome some of these things. That word fornication really is, is, is not only uh, in a broader scale sexual immorality, but if you even want to narrow it down even more, it really means sex outside of marriage. Now, if you uh, would read the Greek translation of the New Testament Bible, and you get to this word fornication here in the third verse of chapter 5 of the book of Ephesians, the Greek word for fornication is called porneia. And for us adults, I don't think I need to explain in any further detail what English word that Greek word is derived from. But you can understand here this morning how important it is when Paul says to not let this once be named among you, it is because it is grossly immoral and has been the fall of many of people, not only outside of the church, but inside of the church as well. And he says, and all uncleanness. And, and really what that is boiling down to, if you look at the Greek interpretation, is just the uncleanness of heart and uncleanness of mind. Whether it's through immoral thoughts or immoral ideas or, or really what's in our heart. What are we filling our minds with? Paul says, let uncleanness of mind not once be named among you. And he goes on to talk about covetousness. Now, covetousness is, is the, the lust, if you will, of things that maybe you don't have or of, the, of those lusts of, of things that maybe you desire or that you want. When you really tie those three words together, fornication, uncleanness, and covetousness, what Paul's really talking about is just let any sort of immoral idea, immoral practice, or immoral idolatry not once be named among you. Why? Because you are saints. You are saints. Right? And going back to the, 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 the really the title of this series, Who Am I? We are saints of God. I don't need a pope or a bishop or a cardinal or a board within a church to tell me that I'm now canonized and can be called a saint and placed up on a wall. When the very Bible itself tells me that I'm already a saint. Folks, I don't need man's permission for this. We don't need man's permission or man's approval to be to be given sainthood, if you will, when we are called saints. And Paul is saying, listen, if you're a saint of God, don't be called a fornicator. Don't be called an unclean person. Don't be called a coveter. And he goes on to say, neither filthiness in verse 4, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, he says, but rather giving of thanks. Paul continues to unpack this list of things for us that we ought to avoid at all costs. As a matter of fact, he says, let it not be once named upon you. Not one time let, not, let, let it not be named upon you. You know, this idea of, of filthiness, again, it's, it's what is in you. It has nothing to do with maybe having on some dirty clothes or you worked all day and your skin is filthy, your, your brow is sweating, and you need to go take a shower. It, that has nothing to do. You're filthy. It has nothing to do with pig pin from Charlie Brown, but it has everything to do with, again, where is your heart at? Where is your mind at? He says, nor foolish talking. Now, the, the Greek interpretation of this is quite interesting because it really says, don't speak moronic words. Don't, don't, don't talk like a moron. The, the, the world is filled with morons, folks. 
Let it not once be named among you and I as saints of God that we have foolish talking in our lips, that we talk nonsense, that we talk foolishness, that we lie or that we deceive with our words or that we make up these tales and these fables for just the sake of being heard. He says, do not let foolish talking be once named among you. And then he says, nor jesting. Interesting word, jesting. I don't think you'll find it anywhere else in the scriptures. It's the idea of inappropriate jokes. Now, if anybody has a great sense of humor, it's God, our creator. I, I look at us. He had to have a sense of humor probably creating me. Not that he laughs at me, but Lord, I, I look at myself sometimes in the mirror, I'm like, Lord, you, you, you're funny. You're funny, right? God has one of the greatest senses of humor in the Bible. I read stories every once in a while coming through the scriptures that absolutely crack me up. God has the greatest sense of humor of all. But what Paul is referring to here this morning is that we are not making inappropriate jokes. We are not being filthy with our words. We are not cursing. We are not saying things that are inappropriate. We are not saying things that, that would make people cringe or make people feel uncomfortable. Jesus would say, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Whatever is in our heart, that's what we will speak. That's why Paul is putting it down right now to make sure that there's no filthiness in our heart. <clears throat> that there's nothing immoral in our heart. That there's no fornication or no uncleanness or no covetousness. No filthiness in our heart. No foolish talk in our heart. No jesting in our heart. Because if there is, that's how you're going to speak. That's how you're going to act. That's how you're going to behave. But he encourages us. He says, instead of doing all that, he says, rather give thanks. <clears throat> give thanks unto God. Thank him for his goodness. Thank him for his glory. Thank him for the praise that we get to give him every day. For the blessings that are bestowed upon us continually for the exceedingly and abundantly above all that we can ever ask or think that we spoke about a few weeks back. Give thanks. Instead of speaking filthiness, instead of speaking foolish talk, instead of speaking terrible jokes and nasty words, Paul says, use your mouth to give thanks unto God. Use your mouth to praise God. Use your mouth to glorify God. And then he says something very alarming in verse number five. He says, for this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. I want to be very clear to paint a picture for you this morning in that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And, and one of the biggest misconceptions that people have of Christianity, and it's at the fault of many preachers and many pastors and many churches, is that when you're walking with Jesus, you're never going to sin again. When you're walking with Jesus, you're free from sin. Boy, how I wish that was the case. Because I tell you what, man, I continue to this day to fall short every day that I am alive. Whether it's in thought, in word, in action, or in deed, we all fall short of the glory of God. Every single one of us does. But Paul is referring to those who choose to live a lifestyle of fornication, 
who choose to live a lifestyle of being one that is unclean or being one that is filthy, choose to live in a, a lifestyle that is covetous, lusting after, idolizing after those things that are ungodly and impure and unholy and unrighteous, Paul says they have no inheritance in the kingdom of God, not one. They cannot inherit the kingdom of God because those lifestyles, those choices of behavior are contrary to the holiness in which we are being asked to walk in, the love of Christ that Paul admonishes us to walk in, and it certainly would grieve the Holy Spirit of any of those of us that have received Christ as our Lord and Savior. I cannot tell you how many times in my life where I knew because of the Holy Spirit of God that what I was doing, that what I was saying, that what I was thinking, that how I was acting was contrary to the holiness and to the righteousness and to the godliness and to the love in which we ought to be walking as saints of God. And I'm thankful every day, and I express my gratitude to the Lord every day for the cross at Calvary, that I am forgiven. That each and every day the Lord's mercies are renewed. Because again, we all fall short. But Paul is saying here, listen, if this is who you are, if you do not, and I'll use a, a, a word that many of us like to use, well, not me, if you do not identify as a saint of God, and you identify as one of these, or you prefer to be identified as one of these, there is no inheritance for you in the kingdom of God. And what that means according to the scriptures is separation from God. And to be separate from God is to be in hell where Jesus says we'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The absence of holiness is darkness. And that's where those who choose to live the way that Paul is describing these people to live are going to end up for all eternity. That's why the gospel of Jesus Christ, at least in my day and in my time, is so vitally important to share with people, to try to get them to see and to understand that it is much more profitable unto them spiritually and emotionally and mentally physically and eternally, to stop identifying with this world, with the things of this world, with the titles that this world wants to give you, and to identify as a saint of the Most High God. I was speaking with my good buddy Ryan Paul Woody earlier this week, and he has struggled a lot in having to adapt socially to a climate at work that is pushing things that go against his belief and his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he believes to be right versus wrong. And he had an epiphany, if you will, from the Lord this week that they need the gospel of Jesus Christ more than anybody else. And that he has taken on the position, taken on the, 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 the responsibility, if you will, to be the light and to be the salt. Somebody's got to be the light, folks. Somebody has to. This world is dark. I'm not talking about the light that we see outside right now. This world is spiritually dark. It is emotionally dark. It is mentally dark. Somebody has to be the light. We have to shine forth the light of God in our lives. 
He says in verse 6, let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things, the things that, that Paul has been listing since verse 3, because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. And so Paul would, would love, if you will, all those that are fornicators, that are unclean, that are coveters, that are filthy, that talk foolishly, that jest, if you will, that are unclean, that are whoremongers, he would wrap all of them together and call them children of disobedience. Wherein the end of verse number three, he calls you and I saints of God, as becometh saints, or as become a saint of God. Far too many people this morning are behind a pulpit telling their congregants, telling you, trying to tell me that living like this is okay for a Christian. Living like this is okay for those that have received Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. That grace abounds. Sure, grace abounds. But it certainly does not take away from the wrath of God that is coming for those that choose to live this kind of life over choosing to live a life that is holy and righteous and pure, walking in love as we are encouraged to walk. Many people are being deceived this morning with these vain words. They are preaching a gospel that does not line up with the gospel of Jesus Christ. They are preaching a false gospel. They are sharing things that are absolute contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Any church, any pastor, any preacher that says that it's okay to continue in these lifestyles, it's that it's okay to continue doing these things, will one day have to answer for the lies and for the false teaching that they shared with people that sent many many of its congregants to hell unawares because they believed that what was be, that what was coming from behind this position was truth i would encourage anybody to please don't take my words for truth but take the word of god for truth don't just come to church on Sunday and get fed whatever the preacher's feeding you and expect to take that home and live on that for the rest of the week. Not a one of you would eat today and then not eat until next Sunday. Physically. Not a one of you. Now maybe you're fasting, okay, whatever the case is. I'm not talking about that. But not a one of you are going to eat this morning and then not have anything to eat until the following Sunday. You're going to be malnourished. You're going to lose strength. You're going to start to break down. Folks, the same thing applies spiritually when all we do is look at our Bibles or hear what a preacher says on Sunday morning. It doesn't work. But these men... Some of these women that are preaching these vain words, that are preaching these false gospels, are bringing with them many, many, many people through the wide and broad gate that leadeth to destruction. And I believe many of those on that day will say, Lord, but I preached in your name. Lord, I cast out devils in your name. Lord, I serve in your name. 
Lord, I did this, that, or the other in your name. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to look at them on that day. Depart from me. I never knew you, you wicked and evil servant. Paul would say in verse number seven, be not ye therefore partakers with them. Do not partake with those that live these lifestyles, with those that behave with this behavior. Many, many times I have had a very difficult time leaving friendships, leaving relationships because of people that were behaving like this, knowing in the back of my mind, I probably shouldn't be friends with this person anymore, but I don't want to hurt them. I don't want to make them feel bad. I don't want to be uncomfortable around them. When Paul says clearly, do not be partakers with them. Don't. If there is somebody in your life that is living as a fornicator is living unclean, is living filthy, that talks foolishly, that makes inappropriate comments and cursings and jokes, that's a coveter, that's an idolater, folks, be not partakers with them, the scripture says. Be kind, be tender hearted, forgive, walk in love but be not partakers with them. In, in other words, don't hang out with them. Don't make them a staple in your life. Love them. Treat them well. Be compassionate towards them. But I encourage you, do not partake with them. Do not join with them in acting like a fool and in doing what it is Paul says we ought to be avoiding at all costs because that's what children of disobedience do. Let it not once be named among you that you are a child of disobedience. He says in verse number eight, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. He says, walk as children of light. Again, as if we needed a reminder this morning, we were sometimes sinners. You know, that word darkness right there, when, or when we're, we read the word darkness uh, uh, in this text that we're coming up to, it really is, is implying or saying that we were sinners. Yes, we were sometimes sinners. But such were some of us. At one time, we were fornicators. At one time, we were unclean. At one time, we were coveters and filthy and talked nonsense and made inappropriate jokes and, and were unclean and, and were idolaters. Paul says, you were once sometimes dark. You were once sometimes sinners. But he also reminds them, but now... You are children of light. You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Uh, again, go, going back to one of these things that, that, that is impossible to do that I spoke about uh, earlier uh, at the beginning of chapter 5. It is impossible to walk in darkness and to walk in light at the same time. You can't do it. You have to pick one. You have to choose one. It's a decision you have to make. You cannot walk in darkness, live as a sinner, and walk in the light at the same time. It, it, they're conflicting. They're at war against one another. But I will say this to you this morning as a word of encouragement. If you are walking in the light Darkness cannot touch you. Darkness cannot touch you. In the same manner that darkness goes away, 
when you flip on a light in a dark room, when we are walking in the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, darkness flees. It hides itself. We're untouchables, folks. I, I don't say that to, to sound cocky or prideful or, or, or to boast or to be lifted up. But when we are a child of God, when we have the light of God surrounding us, when we are walking in that light, darkness flees. That's why the scriptures say that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. The weapons are going to be formed. The weapons will be used. But the weapon cannot prosper. Because you are a child of light. The light of the Lord. He says, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. You know, going back to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Paul sort of addresses that for a moment, if you will, here in verse number 9, that the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, the fruit of the Spirit is in all righteousness, the fruit of the Spirit is in all truth. He says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. You know, there's another time in the scriptures when we are told to prove or to test those things which are in the Lord. If you would go and read the book of Romans, I believe chapter 12, Paul tells us to prove that which is good, that which is acceptable unto God. He says, be not conformed to the ways of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And he says, to test those things that are of God. Why are we encouraged to test those things that are of God? We're not encouraged to test God. I need to be very clear. Don't leave here today. Well, I'm going to test God. I'm going to jump off the roof to see if he'll hold me up. I mean, you're kind of you're kind of playing with your with your life right there, right? But test those things that are righteous. Test those things that are 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 are, are lovely. Test those things that are good. Test those things that are that are truthful. Test them. Test those things that are acceptable unto the Lord. The Lord will tell you if they are not acceptable. The scriptures tell us what is and isn't acceptable. But we are encouraged through the scriptures to test it. Test the Lord. Again, not tempting fate, but just to make sure, Lord, is this of you? Lord, if it's not of you, get it out of my life. But Lord, if this is of you, show me, tell me, take me. Keep letting me go. If not, stop it. He says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now, here's something interesting. We see in verse 7, he says, don't be partakers with them. And we see in verse 11 now, have no fellowship with them. He says, but rather reprove them. What does that word reprove mean? Speak out against it. That's an action, folks. We ought to take action speaking out against the unfruitful works of darkness that exist in this world today. I am not shy. Most of you know. I am not shy about speaking out against the unfruitful works of darkness. Now, it has gotten me in trouble on social media. I have lost followers that I can care less about. If you don't want to follow me anymore, whatever. If you don't want to like what I'm saying, whatever. But we are told here to reprove the unfruitful works of darkness, to speak out against them. And again, beginning of verse number three of our text, Paul tells 
tells us what are some of the unfruitful works of darkness. Yes, we ought to be walking in love. We are told that. Walk in love. But we also ought to be boldly standing up against the unfruitful works of darkness. Too many people today, not only in the pulpit, but in the pews as well, just stay quiet on the issues. They don't want to ruffle feathers. They don't want to make things uncomfortable. We are told to reprove, to speak out against unfruitful works of darkness. But to do so in love. Christ would say, speak the truth in love. You may say to somebody that's living a sinful lifestyle, that's maybe going down a path that they shouldn't go down, Listen, I'm sharing this with you because I love you too much to watch you go down this path without knowing of the forgiveness and of the grace and of the mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What you're doing is wrong. What you're doing is unbiblical. And I implore you, I encourage you to turn your life around and give it to Jesus. Speak the truth in love. I reproved the unfruitful work of darkness while walking in love as we're told to do in this chapter. Paul would even go on to say in verse number 12, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them, those that walk in darkness, in secret. Now, you might say, well, isn't that contrary to speaking out against it? No, it's not. But to sit there and to gossip or to speak about those things, right, amongst yourselves or, or maybe in your little social circles or even to think it or speak it in your own life, in your own heart, in your own mind, Paul says that it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done by those in secret. Don't gossip about it. Don't murmur about it. Go and do something about it. Go and reprove it. But don't sit and gossip about it. He says in verse 13, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest is light. If you speak out against those things, the light will bring forth, will manifest those things that are in the dark. That's what the light does. The light manifests the darkness. If you were to walk into a pitch black room that was filled with cockroaches and spiders and rats, you wouldn't know they were in there. Why? Because it's pitch black. But the moment you turn the light on, boy, are you surprised at what you see. The same with sin. Sin hides in darkness. Now, I would make a point that sin is starting to come out more and more and more into the light. But the context of which Paul is saying is that the darkness, the sin will expose or will be exposed by the light. He says, Wherefore, in verse 14, he saith, and this is from the book of Isaiah, Awake thou that sleepest, or awake those of you that are in sin. He says, And arise from the dead, come out of your grave. He says, And Christ shall give you light. Wake up. Wake up, sinners. Come out of your grave. Come out of the death that you're spiraling down towards. Save yourself by placing your faith and trust in Jesus Christ from an eternity apart from him. 
Wake up, Paul reminds them. Come out of your slumber. Escape the grave. And Christ will give you light. He says in verse 15, See then that ye walk circumspectly, it's a big word, I'll break it down, not as fools, but as wise. That word circumspectly means to really walk cautiously, walk aware. And again, I'm, I'm not going back to this whole idea of, well, it's only when I'm standing up and I'm walking and I'm, and I'm moving. No, live your life cautious as a Christian, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, as a follower of the Most High God. Live your life aware of what is around you. Live it cautiously of those things, of those places, of those people that are around you. Paul says to walk circumspectly, walk aware. He says, don't walk as a fool walks. A fool would walk with their eyes down, their head down, their, their head buried in the sand. They don't want to know. They've got horse blinders on. They don't want to see. They don't want to deal with it. That's how a fool walks. When you can't see what's around you, you're not going to be able to see what's coming after you. That's how a fool walks. He says, but walk wisely. Walk in wisdom. Walk in understanding. Biblical wisdom. Godly wisdom. Holy wisdom. He says, walk in that way. And he says in verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. No doubt in Paul's Days, he certainly faced unprecedented evil. Go back to the Roman Empire that was still thriving during Paul's day. Emperor Nero from the Roman Empire. The evil that was brought upon the Christians through the hands of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees and of the magistrates of the temple. Evil days plagued Paul. Evil things plagued Paul. Evil people plagued Paul. And folks, nothing has changed in 2,000 years. We are living in unprecedented evil days today. Whether or not they can be compared to the days of Noah, I don't know. Whether or not they can be compared to the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, I don't know. But one thing I do know is that we are surrounded by evil. And Paul says, redeem the time. Buy your time. Take advantage of your time to walk circumspectly, not foolishly, but wisely, because the days are evil. Yes, it's a beautiful day out today. It's beautiful. God's glory is being extended to us today when you walk outside. But that does not take away from the fact that we are surrounded by evil, by darkness, by wickedness. And we must cautiously redeem the time taking advantage of the opportunities that we have today to live lives of righteousness and of holiness and of godliness, walking in love, being kind to one another, being tenderhearted to one another, forgiving one another. We must redeem the time while we can because the day is coming when we will no longer be able to do it and we will be, in other words, entrusting which is a very scary thing in trusting those around us into the hands of people that are going to want to kill and steal and destroy. We ought to redeem the time wisely to try to rescue as many people as we can from the dark days that are coming that lie ahead for those that have not placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says in verse 17, Wherefore be ye not unwise, 
foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. This is the will of the Lord. Well, I, I, need, I need the Lord to speak to me. I haven't heard the Lord speak yet. Bro, have you opened your Bible? The will of the Lord is given to us in the scriptures. That's why I go back. Prove those things that are acceptable unto the Lord. If it's not the will of God, the scriptures will tell you. God will tell you. You will be kicking against pricks that we have no business kicking against like Paul did. In the book of Acts. Well, I'm trying to go down this path, but I keep running into roadblock after roadblock after obstacle. Well, maybe because you shouldn't be on that path. That's the Lord trying to talk to you. I remember in the silly movie with Jim Carrey, Bruce Almighty, it's kind of towards the beginning. He's just had a terrible day. He's been fired from his job. His girlfriend doesn't like him. And he's out on a car ride. And he's like, Lord, just give me a sign. Lord, show me a sign. And literally in front of him is like a Caltrans truck that is all lit up with orange lights that has do not enter, do not pass, all these warning signs in front of him, and yet he continues to drive. And eventually he crashes the car. That's when he throws his keys into the lake. If you guys remember, smite me, almighty oh smiter, if you've ever seen the movie. God will give you a sign. God will tell you what his will is, but you've got to be in tune with the Holy Spirit walking in love as we are told to from this chapter of Ephesians. And he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. My little girl's reading the Bible right now. Thank you, Grace. Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, again, I'll go back to another one of these ideas. You cannot be drunk with wine and filled with the Spirit of God at the same time. Now, does it mean that the Spirit of God leaves you if you drink? If you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, no, but you're going to grieve the Holy Spirit. You're going to quench, you're going to quiet the Holy Spirit. Paul says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Instead of being filled with alcohol, be filled with the Spirit. There's a very dark reason as to why hard liquor is called spirits. Why? Because it goes against the Holy Spirit of God to fill yourself with these spirits that you can purchase and buy and go and drink. If you want to be filled with the Spirit of God, there is a list of things here that Paul is giving us that we must avoid. One of which is be not drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit of God. I, I, I'm convicted in my own life. As, as much of an alcoholic that I used to be, and it still plagues me this day, but praise the Lord, I've been sober for years. I'm convicted in my own life to be of sober mind because what if? What if my family needs me? And I'm not sober-minded. What if I need to react? And I'm not sober-minded. What if I'm called to go somewhere? And I'm not sober-minded. What if the Lord says, Solomon, now is when I need you. And I'm not sober-minded. I'm convicted by that. But then Paul in the last few verses tells us what to do. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. 
Folks, I can't tell you how many times throughout the day I've just got a worship song going on in my heart. I listen to it when I'm driving. I listen to it when I'm working out. As a matter of fact, my girls came down on Friday morning because they've been on spring break this week. My girls came down and I'm working out in my garage and I got worship music going on out there as I'm working out. And Grace goes, Dad, you listen to music out here? I said, yeah, I praise Jesus when I'm working out. I will piggyback on verse 18. If you are drunk with wine or if you've been drinking, you cannot speak to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. You may attempt to in your mind that is now being controlled by a substance, but it will not work again. You grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You quench the Holy Spirit of God when you fill yourself with things that go against the very spirit that Paul tells us we ought to be filled with. And when you're filled with the spirit of God, you just supernaturally, if you will, spiritually, you just start singing the praises of God. You start singing the psalms. You start singing the hymns. You start singing the spiritual songs. <clears throat> you start making a melody in your heart to the Lord. And when you're filled with the Spirit, you tend to give thanks to the Lord in verse 20 for all things. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for this house. Lord, thank you for my family. Lord, thank you for this meal. Lord, thank you for this job. Lord, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you. Give thanks unto the Lord. And finally, in verse 21, Paul says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Again, if we are to be filled with the Spirit of God, as Paul tells us in verse 18, we will have a desire to not only speak and to sing and to make melodies in our heart towards God. We will not only have a desire to give thanks in all things always to God for what he has done with us, but we will have a desire in our hearts to serve one another, to submit to one another. Hey man, what do you need? What can I do for you? How can I encourage you? How can I bless you? How can I minister to you? How can I preach to you? There's just this natural desire given to us by the Holy Spirit to want to submit and to serve one another because of our admiration because of our awe of God in all that he has done for us. That is the will of God for our lives in Christ Jesus. And it is there this morning that you're probably saying, please, Lord, end, that I'm going to end this morning. Church family, I pray that these first 21 verses of Ephesians chapter 5 have been an encouragement to you. Again, next week, we're going to be focusing primarily on marriage and Paul's instructions for marriage out of the remainder of Ephesians chapter 5. I encourage you all to tune in, to come and join us and be encouraged in the Lord. Church family, thank you so much for being a part of our little family this morning. I pray that this message has been an encouragement and a blessing to you. Bow your heads with me and let's pray and we can get going. Heavenly Father, Lord God, as I've uh, uh, sort of lost my voice, Lord, as I've continued preaching this morning, Father God, I pray that what will not be lost this morning on us is this message that you have given us out of Ephesians chapter 5, Lord God. I pray that it would be used to continue to encourage, to continue to edify, Lord, to continue to grow us in our faith, causing us to be of one spirit with you, Lord God. And Father, I pray that as Paul 
from the get-go told us to walk in love as Christ walked in love and gave himself for us as an offering and as a sacrifice for a sweet-smelling savor unto God that we too, Lord God, would walk in love and walk in Christ Jesus the way that he walked, Father God. I thank you, Father, for this word. I, I thank you for the blessings, Lord God, that we just continue to get a daily, Lord God, not only from you, Father God, but from knowing your word and from investing time in your word, Lord. I just ask that it would continue to go before us as the lamp unto our feet and as the light unto our path, Father God. And I pray for just a multitude of blessings to come upon this church family, Lord God, those present, those watching right now uh, online, and those that are going to hear this later, Father God, may you just open up the windows of heaven and pour out your favor and blessings over their lives. Father God, we love you. We thank you. I ask and pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.